Section 1.8, uh, I would kind of consider it a review of inequalities. So looking at a few different types of inequalities. The first type here actually is on numbers one and two. These guys are polynomial inequalities. Okay, so I have a polynomial function. I'd like to know, say, where this polynomial function is positive, greater than zero. So I have a couple ideas for what I could do. I mean, I guess one idea would be I could actually graph the function. We just talked a couple sections ago about graphing polynomials. So actually I could do this pretty quickly. Let's get a rough sketch. Let's see, the y-intercept. If I plug in x equals zero, I'm gonna get zero. Let's see, the x-intercepts are zero, one, and negative two. The end behavior, I'm gonna have five x to the six, seven, eight, nine. Left side down, right side up. Let's see, at negative two touches, zero touches, and at one crosses. So then what I'm looking for here is where is this polynomial greater than zero? So that would be here, right? So the solution would be this polynomial would be greater than zero on the interval one to infinity. Okay, so that, that option works pretty well if I have a simple function. Option two, I'd say we use more often. It's a little bit faster usually than graphing. So option two, we would make what we call a sign chart. Okay, so that means we look at the function and we list the zero. So we're making like a number line here. So the zeros, let's see, we have negative two, zero, and one, this doesn't even have to be to scale. Okay, then I test a value. So I pick a number, any number other than the zeros that are on the number line. So I don't know, pick something easy, like x equals 100. It's over here, right? And then I plug that in the function. So I say, okay, I'd have five times 100 to the six, that's a positive number. 100 minus one is positive. 100 plus two squared is positive. Overall, I have a positive number. So I don't even care what the number is. I just care if it's positive or negative. So that means in this interval, the function is positive. Then from there, I have a couple options. I could pick a number here and test it pick a number here and test it, pick a number here and test it, but that's a lot of work. So here's the other idea. Once I know the sign in one interval, then what I could do is I could actually use the multiplicities. Okay, so I could look over here and I could say, look over here. At one, the graph crosses. So that means it has to change sign. So wouldn't it have to be negative in this interval then? Okay, what happens at zero? Touches, right? So if the graph touches, it would have to be negative on both sides there. Then at negative two, touches. So again, if it's negative, it'd still be negative. Then I look at my chart and I say, what am I looking for? 
So on my chart here, I'm looking for where this function is greater than zero. So I'm looking for where the function is positive. Okay, so that's only on that interval. So again, my solution would be one to infinity. Okay, obtained a different way. Of course, same solution. So that's the approach we usually take. Let's look at another one. So this guy's also a polynomial inequality, but before I can use either approach, I'm going to do a sign chart for this one, but before I can do that, I have to get a zero on one side because I have to be able to find the zeros to put on the sign chart. So let me go ahead and factor this guy. It's a difference of squares. And now I'm going to make my sign chart. That's what this is. Okay, so then I'll list the zeros. Negative 2, 0, and 2. Then I test a value. So any value other than the values on the chart. So I don't know, I tend to kind of pick like a really big number. Plugging that in here. Okay, so let me see what the signs would be. 100 itself is positive. 100 plus 2 is positive. 100 minus 2 is positive. So in this interval, the function is positive. Now, if you look at the multiplicities here, actually all the multiplicities are 1s. So that means the graph crosses at each intercept. So it has to change sign then. So this guy would alternate signs. Okay, then I look back at the question, so be careful. Let's see. This one is asking me where the function is negative. So actually, on this sign chart, I'm looking for the negative regions. Those two, okay? Or, or zero. It's less than or equal to zero. So that means I'll actually include, when I write out my solution, I'll include the ends there. Okay. So by the way, this is an interval notation. So sometimes we ask, sometimes we say write the solution also in say set notation. Could do that. That's the set builder. And then sometimes we say, sketch the solution set on a number line. So this looks similar to the sign chart. Let's see, I'd say here's negative 2. I'd shade to the left. Let's say here's 0. Here's 2. And I'd shade there. Okay, so there's my solution written in all three notations. Why don't I go back up here and write this one in the set notation. This is the interval. And then on a number line, just look like More polynomial. This is actually just a quadratic function, a parabola. So I'd start by getting a zero on one side, then I'd factor. Let's see, I need a six. Um, maybe a two and a three. 
minus and plus, does that work? 2x squared minus 4 plus 3 minus 6, looks like it works. So then I make my sign chart. got negative one and a half and two. Test a value. This one would be easy to plug in x equals zero. Okay, so remember when I'm plugging the zero in, I'm looking here. Okay, so when I do that, let's see. I'll have zero plus three is positive. Zero minus two is a negative. Positive times a negative is negative. So in this region, the function is negative. Then I look at my multiplicities. They're both ones. Graph is going to cross. Means it alternates in sign, crosses, right? And then I write out a solution. So let me see, what am I looking for? Negatives. It's like that region. Here's my interval notation. Here's my set builder notation. Here's my number line. And there we have it. So you can do the same kind of thing looking at rational functions. So here's a rational inequality. So again, I would need to start by getting a zero on one side. So let me go ahead and subtract the 4. Let me do an LCD. Okay, so negative 2x minus 4x plus 8 over x minus 2, less than 0. Okay, so I mean, I can do the same thing where I could say, well, let me graph. Normally we wouldn't choose that method, but why don't we do one like that, just to see how it works. So I'm graphing this rational function. So what are some of the things we found? We found the y-intercept, set x to 0, that'd be negative 4. that negative 4. And then let's see, we found the, actually maybe I won't do that, I'll put it down further. I don't know if we need the room. X-intercepts, we looked at the numerator, equal to 0. Vertical asymptote, the denominator is zero. Be here. Horizontal asymptote. I look at the leading terms. Like that, that'd be y is negative six. Well, looks like I need even more of them. 
Let's rearrange. equals negative six. Okay. And so think like that. And then let me see. Um the power, the multiplicity on that vertical asymptote is one. So alternates in sign as we go across the asymptote. And so the other piece would be over here. Okay, so we got it graphed. That was a fair amount of work. Not, not too bad. Okay, so then what about writing out the solution? Because remember, what we're really trying to answer is this question. Where is the function less than zero? So if you look at the graph, look, the y's are less than zero all the way up to 4 thirds, and then they're less than zero again once you pass two. Okay, so my solution set be negative infinity up to that intercept of 4 thirds, and then union to to infinity because the only place the graph is positive is actually this region right here between four thirds and two. There's my interval notation. I can write set notation. I can sketch solution on a number line. So then, well, that's option one. So really, graphing rational functions is a fair amount of work. So I'll where to put this. Let's do it here. So what if instead I say option two, and I do the same problem with a sign chart? Okay, so I take my simplified rational function, that's what I had right up here, right? And then I say, okay, so when I set up my sign chart for a rational function, if you look at the graph, for a rational function, there are two places where the, the function could change sign. At an x-intercept, or as we jump across a vertical asymptote, okay? So when I go to fill in the values on the sign chart, I have to fill in both x-intercepts and vertical asymptotes. So in other words, I'm looking at where the top or the bottom is equal to zero. Okay, so where's the top equal to zero? That's that four thirds, that's the x-intercept. The bottom is zero at two. Let me do it this way then. Okay. So then I, I uh, choose a value. Maybe zero it goes here, plugging it in here. So I'd have negative six times zero, zero, eight, 
is positive over negative 2. So I have a positive over a negative. It's a negative number. Then I can look at the powers. Both powers are 1s. Alternates and sign. But then I look at the question. So I'm looking for negatives. Okay, so then when I write out my solution, I'd have the same intervals, right? But I think that was a little bit faster. So, let me just show you the most common mistake on this one that students make while we're at it. So here's the most common mistake. Don't do this. Student says, well, I'm going to take this problem at the very beginning, and I'm going to make this problem really easy by just multiplying up the denominator. Do we get the correct answer? No, clearly not. So when I have a rational inequality, I would never clear the fraction. The reason why is because I actually have the x in the denominator here. So remember what happens when you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative? You have to flip the sign, right? Flip the inequality sign. So the thing is, because I have a variable in the bottom of the fraction here, and I don't know whether that expression is positive or negative. So I could not clear the fraction because I don't know if I would need to flip the inequality or not. So as you can see, I do not get the correct answer if I do that. So when I'm dealing with a rational inequality, as soon as I see that, I know what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to make a sign chart. I mean, unless I want to graph. Okay. Let's take a look at another rational inequality here. Let's look at number five. So again, first thing I would do is make one side a zero. So I'd start by subtracting that x. And I would need an LCD. Okay, so that would look like so. Combine the like terms. And then what else can I do with that? Maybe factor out that negative. And then factor that trinomial, so that'd be x plus 1 times x plus 1. So x plus 1 quantity squared. Now, let me make my sign chart. Remember, for rational inequality, I look at the top and the bottom. Vertical asymptote, there's the x-intercept. Let's test a value, I don't know, maybe zero. So I'm gonna substitute that in here. Okay, and I'm interested in the sign. So negative, let's see, that'd be positive, and that'd be positive. So the result would be negative. All right, now I'm looking at the exponents. Okay, so let's see, negative one touches at that x-intercept. So it keep the same sign. Okay, the exponent, the multiplicity of that vertical asymptote is a one. So that's going to alternate in sign. Let's 
gonna be positive as I go across that asymptote then. All right, then I look back at the question. I'm looking for positive, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so I'm really interested in this region. That's where the function is positive, but then be careful. There's one other instant where the function is actually equal to zero at that intercept, right? So when I go to write out my solution set, remember I do not include the vertical asymptote. That's always excluded, right? That's where the function is undefined. However, at the instant this function hits its x-intercept here, it is actually equal to zero for that single value of x. Okay, let me write the other, the set builder notation. the number line. Let's see, so I'd have negative three, shade to the left, and then just the single value, negative one. And so there's my solution set. that rational inequality. Okay, so those are polynomial and rational inequalities. So we're going to look at another type of inequality. This type is different. So we kind of take a different approach. So here I'm looking at absolute value inequalities. So these are more like logic problems, okay? So this first one's very simple. It says, find all values of x where the absolute value of x is less than two. So, I mean, if you think about plugging values in there, like if I plug one in there, absolute value of one is one, it's less than two. What about negative one? Absolute value of negative one is one, it's less than two. What if I plug three in there? Well, absolute value of three is three. That's not less than two. What about absolute value of negative two? That's two. That's not less than two. So looks like it would be all numbers in between two and negative two, because think about what absolute value is saying. It's measuring a distance, right? So this is saying, all values of x less than two units from zero. Okay, so I can even sketch that on a number line very easily. Here's zero. Okay, all units, all values within two units of zero would be two units left, two units right. And then I would use open circles on the ends there. Okay, could do my interval notation, my set builder notation. And so there's my solution set. So I'm really thinking about absolute value as a distance when I'm answering these questions. Okay, let's try one that's a little more interesting. He's all got... Hmm, where's my number two? Oh, there's my number two. I see. These all got kind of clustered together. Actually, this one's not all that much more interesting than this is the other simple one. So I just wanted to look at the case. Well, what about when I have a greater than or greater than or equal? 
So what the heck is this saying? This is saying all values that are at least two units from zero. Okay, so think about if I set up a number line here. Look, we want the distance from zero to be <clears throat> at least two. So I could have values over here, right? The absolute value of five is more than two. But also over here, because the absolute value of say negative three is three, which is greater than or equal to two. Okay, in this case, the ends would be included. I would close those dots in. That's because I have the or equal to here. Okay, so then let me write out the interval notation and then the set builder notation. And so there's my solution. And all three notations. So you'll notice that when I have an absolute value inequality with a less than or a less than or equal, I'm going to end up with one interval for my solution. Because what I'm interested in there is I'm interested in values that are within some number of units of zero. So that's within in one interval there. First is notice if I have a greater than or a greater than or equal. I'm going to end up with two intervals, okay? Because there I'm saying at least some number of units from zero. So I'm actually interested in outer regions, though so there would be two of those. So that's just a pattern to notice. Okay, so that means when I look at these more interesting inequalities, like number three here, first thing I always want to do with something like this is I want to isolate the inequality. So if the app or app, let me say that again. First thing I want to do with these is isolate the absolute value. Assuming the absolute value is not already isolated. That's going to be always my first step if that's not done. Okay, so that means in this case, I have to add three. So it looks like that. Then I go, okay, so I notice that I have a less than or equal. So that tells me right away, my solution set's gonna be one interval. Because this is saying that this quantity is within seven units of zero. Okay, so you can do like a little sketch here if it's helpful. So that quantity 2x plus 5 has to be within 7 units of 0. So doesn't that mean that my, that's kind of scratch work, my 2x plus 5 has to be within negative seven and seven in between negative seven and seven. So what I've written right here, by the way, where I have this three and one inequality like that, where the variable is stuck in between two numbers, that's called a compound inequality. Okay, so I go ahead and solve that by say, let's see, uh, subtracting five. And then divide by two. Okay, so if I multiply or divide by a negative, I'd have to flip the inequality. Okay, but not by a positive. Okay, so let's like that. And so then I just have to write out the other notations. I mean, that's really already the set builder notation. Just move that over. 
the way I can add my And before I do anything else, so I'll subtract the one, divide by two. Okay, then I notice that I have a greater than. So I'm like, okay, my solution set's going to be two intervals. Okay, then what else? So then we're saying that quantity x minus 3 is more than 5, why did I get a 3? 5 halves. Let's fix that. Okay. So if you think about that little rough sketch here, so that quantity has to be in the outer regions here. So actually when I set this up, this time I'm going to have two different inequalities. I'm going to have either x minus 3 is less than negative 5 halves, or x minus 3 is greater than 5 halves. Okay, so I think it's helpful to have this number line here. That way I can see. So this guy comes from the left side. This guy comes from the right side. Okay, so when I have two intervals, I need two inequalities. Then I solve each of these inequalities separately, right? So I'd add three. Let's see, six halves minus five halves, one half. And then this one, I add six halves. What is that? 11 halves. So when I write this out, I actually need two inequalities. Okay, because if you think about it, it wouldn't make sense to write a compound inequality here. Because in this case, our values are not in between two numbers, right? They're either over here or over here. So I have two intervals, right? There's no way to write that then as a compound inequality. I can show you some of the weird things that people do if I can come up with strange things. Let's see. So here's something that I see students do. They're like, Okay, let's see. 11 halves is less than x is less than 1 half. And they try to write the inequality like so. So would that work? Well, let me see. So when you write a compound inequality, you're really writing a three-sided inequality. So I'm saying three things. I'm saying x is greater than 11 halves. Oh, that looks good. I'm saying x is less than a half. Oh, that looks good. But be careful, because the third thing I'm saying is that if I cover up the middle piece here, I have to have a true statement. Is 11 halves less than a half? No. So there's a logic 
problem here, right? So I, th and the reason why is because, well, I can't write this as a three and one inequality. I have to write this as two separate inequalities because I have two separate intervals. Here's something else that, you know, that, that, that tells you right away something's wrong. So anytime, if you were to write a compound inequality where you had the signs in opposite directions, we never write compound inequalities like that. So that's a no-no. The signs always face the same way. Those are some common mistakes. Let's try these last couple. Okay, so in number six, the absolute value is already isolated. Hmm, this is kind of a special problem because the number on the right side is negative. So if you think about what this is saying, the left side here is an absolute value. The, what kind of number does an absolute value give me out? Well, it gives me a number that is more than or maybe equal to zero, right? So the left side is always more greater than or equal to zero. So if I have a number on the left side that's more than or equal to zero, wouldn't that always be greater than a negative three? In other words, no matter what number I plug in the left side, the absolute value of that number is always more than a negative number. So actually, wouldn't the solution set for this one be all real numbers? In other words, any number I plug in the left side, this is going to be a true statement. Okay, so the reason this is a special case is because once the absolute value is isolated, I have a negative number on the right. That tells me I'm dealing with a special case. Okay, so look out for that. So look at this next one. This one's also a special case. First thing I have to do is isolate the absolute value. So I multiply or divide both sides by that negative. Don't forget to flip the inequality. So you see how again here, I noticed that the absolute value is isolated. I have a negative number on the right side. I know I have a special case. So then I think about what this is saying. This side, again, is an absolute value. Okay, an absolute value is always more than or equal to zero, okay? So this is impossible because what this is saying is it's saying the absolute value is less than a negative number. It would be impossible for that to be true. A distance cannot be a negative number, right? So this guy actually has no solution. Okay. So those are my two special cases.